Uh, so it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Cecilio Banner and Maria Mengsten for that for the presentation on the air taxi. You're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, wholeheartedly, good morning from Europe. Thanks for having us. Uh, you know that we are exploring in quite a few geographies around the globe, um, but Florida has grown dear to our hearts. So we're very sorry about the situation. We are very sorry um, for, for not being able to be there in person, but we hope we can catch up in person with you as a board as soon as possible, actually, once the situation will have changed. Um, thanks a lot also to, to Christina. I think that was an outstanding study and, and what a job, right, especially with respect to air taxi. You know, many of the manufacturers are still very much in stealth mode, and I think it's really hard to look behind what's in there. We will open up a bit today. Um, and at the same time, there is also a huge variety in the market for electric air taxis. Uh, you outlined the three different kind of concepts that are out there. Lilium clearly is a, is a vector thrust, and it comes with a few actually unique selling points and specific um, performance criteria of the aircraft. Um, so thanks for that, and maybe to avoid a few misunderstandings that are quite common, actually, um, maybe one to um, uh, highlight observations at the beginning before we deep dive into individual charts and, and analysis. Um, the first is that the Lilium service is possible in existing regulatory frameworks. Uh, we have been for years actually liaising very closely with FAA, uh, both on the federal level as well as on the local level. I've been actually chairing GAMA's EVTOL committee, which is the Global Aviation Manufacturers Association for quite some time now. And there is a very close liaison actually with FAA and an understanding that especially the Lilium service, that we have the capacity to transport five people, so including one pilot physically on board, and where we can, with a very high safety level and level of precision, actually operate into aerodromes of different kinds, uh, can take advantage of the existing so-called rules of the air. We will be registered as a regular airline. The pilots will be fully um, uh, certified as CPL pilots, uh, and the aircraft obviously will be traditionally um, certified by the authorities in UK um, FAA. Second, our service is highly meaningful in terms of um, throughput. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, given the high speed of our, um, of our aircraft, which is up to 185 miles, um, and given, again, the five-seater configuration, we can transport many, many people on a single vehicle, as small as it might be, and through a single piece of infrastructure. So if you think of the St. Pete, uh, Tampa example, and Marie of my team, who will cover substantial parts of the, of the presentation in a minute, actually will deep dive into that. If you think of such a connection, we can actually turn around a few times um, in an hour. Uh, so transport maybe 10, 12, or even more passengers on a single vehicle within one hour, whereas the taxi, we all know that, on average, transports some 0.5 passengers per hour. If you think even bigger, and that's only possible on basis of very few of those EVTOL aircraft, but in our case it is, if you think of Tampa to Orlando, for example, you could do it maybe one and a half, maybe two times per hour on average. Um, so this means you know, six or eight passengers, and this is even more powerful in terms of you know, 400, 500, 600 passenger miles per hour that you produce on a single vehicle. So it's meaningful. And the third, and that obviously is closely related to the second, is that air taxis actually, especially if they come with the requirements and specifications of our aircraft, are among, if not the most efficient means of transportation, if you look at it from a global economic perspective. What I mean by that is that you can do this orlando Tampa um, connection and everything else in our radius um, of operational range on very, very lean infrastructure, right? The, the, the paths that you would need in the respective cities, A and B, are extremely lean in terms of surface consumption, so also from an environmental perspective, as well as financially and, and from a cost perspective, and you don't need any connecting infrastructure in between. Also, if you compare our throughput, which already on a, on a small path that could be established on a rooftop, for example, 
if you compare that, which is a few hundred passengers, up to 1,000 passengers per hour on such a you know, landing pad, if you compare that per square meter or square footage versus how many passengers are being throughput in a large international airport, let's say LAX or Chicago, we outperform them actually by um, 100 or even 1,000 in terms of passengers per hour and square meter. So this is from a cost, from an environmental perspective, and therefore then in the end also a price and customer satisfaction perspective, obviously, among the most efficient, if not the most efficient vehicle in the market. Progressing maybe with the presentation, and I don't know if only I had lost it. Um, actually, we wanted to cover three, thanks a lot. Uh, we wanted to cover three chapters. One gives you a bit of an overview of what Lilium is, where we stand as a project, what we're doing. Um, second is uh, focus on the aircraft, how it's operating, um, and why it's so safe and so fast. Um, and then thirdly, and, and mainly, is the application in your case, how such a service could look like along the west coast of, of Florida and beyond, almost across the whole state. Lilium recently celebrated its fifth anniversary. Um, it was in 2015 that actually four aeronautical engineers found together um, at Technical University Munich, all of them in, in terms of PhDs and master's degrees focusing on propulsion technology, which is really kind of the secret recipe of the success and the efficiency of our aircraft. And what started as a you know, humble team in the uh, famous startup garage set up um, has grown to actually the largest EVTOL developing entity in the world, even if you compare to projects like Boeing, Bell, or, or Airbus, with uh, 500 um, employees, actually. Uh, despite COVID in the past few months, We've hit actually 400, 450, and just this week actually um, welcomed the, the 500 uh, employee uh, to the project. We do that on basis of a very solid funding, and you see a few of our investors um, in the line at the bottom. This includes the CEO and, and founder um, of Skype um, and his equivalent, uh, Andrew Beebe, uh, from Twitter, uh, who have invested in us early on. Um, funding has reached uh, almost 400 million US dollars by now. Um, and the team has not only grown in size, actually, but very much also in terms of depth, uh, especially over the last one, one and a half years, maybe. I think it's quite impressive in terms of how aviation and how experienced aviation our project um, has actually become. Um, a few colleagues that, that uh, we may want to highlight here, um, top row in the middle, EFMC, he was actually the number two in the A, 50, um, in the A350 uh, program by ABAS, uh, leading quality for that program. Quality-wise, A350 is potentially among the, um, the strongest aircraft in the market. Um, below him, uh, Brian actually was also number two in his capacity as COO of the Eurofighter program. To his left, Dirk Gebser, who's been leading um, the A320 um, manufacturing with ABAS, so every ABAS a319, 20, 21, 21 Neo was basically produced and manufactured under his watch, three such aircraft per day when uh, he left um, Airbus. And many others, including colleagues from uh, Boeing, NASA, and, and Raytheon, several other uh, established aviation uh, players. Unless there's any questions at this point in time, maybe moving on to the fun part of it, which is obviously the aircraft. And we had introduced and un unveiled that last year, about a year ago, uh, actually, to the world in terms of our fully electric five-seater uh, aircraft, uh, which hits all our operational and meets all our um, operational specifications. Uh, the, the concept is quite unique. Uh, Christina was alluding to that in her study already. 36 fully electric ducted fan engines. Um, almost perfectly centered around, uh, um, uh, distributed around the center of gravity of the fuselage on, in layman's terms, four wings. So it's two wings and two canards. And they are seamlessly tiltable, basically. So when taken off, the, the engines are um, fully directed to the ground, and then they can you know, tilt up to 90 uh, degrees backwards. Um, and therefore, already after having you know, climbed to a few um, meters, maybe 15, 20 feet of an altitude, the, um, what we call transition is um, actually being performed. Um, and with that kicks in basically 
all or kick in all the effects of wing-borne flight physics, right? And this is why our range with the 185 miles on a single battery charge and why our speed parameters also 185 miles and be, per hour and we reach them very, very quickly after takeoff are so different from almost everything else that you see in the EVTOL market because 95% plus actually of EVTOL projects are copters and they come obviously as Christina was pointing out in the study with a very limited, not only range and speed specification, but also in terms of payload. Um, typically copter projects um, have the payload for one pilot and one passenger that has obviously tremendous implications on the throughput, on the utilization, and, and on the pricing. But only on basis of um, the numbers that I highlighted at the very beginning in terms of the four passengers being pooled and very smart city, fully electrically, on demand, in a pooled fashion, uh, being put to the destination together, only on basis of that you can reach really economics of scale and also a price tag that is non-exclusive um, but what we call very democratic in the end, in terms of it will be roughly around taxi pricing. Um, Marie will deep dive into that in a minute um, at launch of operations and then even decrease over time when we take the pilot out of the cockpit after a few years uh, and then the networks will get sensified. A few uh, facts and figures uh, as to the, to the aircraft, uh, some of which I've already mentioned. I think two are absolutely important for you um, as, a, as a board uh, in terms of the safety and in terms of the um, acoustic profile of the aircraft. And for actually exactly those two dimensions, we have highly optimized the design. This is why we don't believe in open propellers. This is why we shield off uh, every single of the ducted fans. Uh, so actually uh, none of the components of the, of the ducted fan uh, in terms of a blade loss scenario that we would know from helicopter operations could happen, and at the same time, you're using actually A350 similar technology to shield off and absorb a lot of the acoustics already within the engine, so they are not being emitted neither into the fuselage where the passengers sit nor uh, to the outside. So already the five-seater demonstrator that we currently uh, have operating, as you saw in the video, actually could be put inner city, um, so not only operate from airports even in a place like Europe that is totally not used to inner city helicopter operations. With that comes also, last sentence from my side, the very high safety level. This is a so-called 10 to the minus nine safety level, which means one, what the regulator calls catastrophic events in one billion flight hours, as opposed to typically uh, helicopters need 10 to the minus six, which is in one million flight hours, and therefore roughly a thousand times less safe. You will ask where does it come from? comes from us being electric. We can afford to leave many components out so they can't fail if they're not there. No gearboxes, no oil and water circuits, many other things that you also know from electric vehicles partially, no aeronautical control surfaces in our case on board so you don't have to maintain them as well. Makes us cheap in operations and for the customer. Sorry, was that a question? I didn't hear a question. Uh, anyone ask? Okay. Um, Commissioner Kemp, I have a question. Uh, yes, yes. Can, we, can we hold the questions until we, he finishes with the presentation for the bill? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he was finished the presentation. Excuse no, me. No, no, no. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sorry, just finishing off this part in terms of the safety level. With that payload that we don't have to invest into components that we don't need anymore, being electric. Uh, we can invest in high redundancy. So there's no single point of failure within the aircraft, but every system is being backed up to another one. And this is how we reach the 10 to the minus nine, which is the same safety level as for traditional, actually, airline commercial operators. With that, we would segue a bit into the application, how a service in Florida could look like. And I'd like to hand over to Marie Mason of my team. Thank you. Thank you, Tassilo, and thank you very much to the board for uh, inviting us today. So moving on to the service um, here of the Lilium Jet, um, we're offering an on-demand air mobility service, uh, which will be point to point between two landing pads um, and can connect entire regions. One of the important success factors, of course, um, of this mobility solution is going to be the price. 
Um, to be clear here, this is not a service that we envision for the rich, um, where uh, someone can own an aircraft and land um, in his backyard. Uh, we're rather looking at a service that will be available to all uh, from public spaces um, and at an affordable price point as well. So here um, is the example from Tampa to St. Pete, um, where the trip would take around eight minutes for a price which we would estimate between $60 and $90, uh, $90 being the most conservative um, price point. Essentially, on a short trip such as this one, we base our price on um, the price of a taxi ride. And if it were a longer trip, for example, Tampa to Orlando, um, we would base our price on a short domestic flight. Important to note here is that the price that you see um, is based on our entry into service price, so from day one, which means that here we have a pilot on board. As you can imagine, this is one of our highest costs, um, so it will be more expensive um, on day one. At the same time, there are three main factors which are going to allow us to decrease this price point very significantly within just a few years. The first one being, of course, um, network effects. As soon as we have more landing pads and more jets flying around uh, in the region where we would start, as well, in, as, well as the production costs uh, going down, but also the pilots being removed uh, from the cockpit. And really the vision ultimately is to be able to commute with the Lilium jet at a price which would be comparable to owning uh, your own car. Um, and in case you're wondering how an electric air taxi can meet the price of a taxi ride, um, on a similar route, um, it's rather simple. So let's say you want to go from um, Tampa Airport to um, the St. Pete Beach um, with a taxi. Typically, the taxi will have waited for you at the airport. Um, there's a high chance that he will not be driving with a cab full of passengers. Um, and then he will not be driving straight because as you know, on the road, there's a security factor. Um, and on top of that, there's going to be traffic. Um, by contrast, uh, the Lilium jet will have all the passengers onto its aircraft to maximize utilization and will be flying B-Line, um, which will allow it to complete the trip in eight minutes compared to 35 minutes um, with a taxi. So sure, we have an aircraft and a pilot which are more expensive than a taxi and uh, its driver, uh, but at the same time, we're able to deliver 20 times the throughput um, as a taxi on this kind of route. Um, and this is what makes our service um, available, uh, affordable. Uh, next slide, please. So here's kind of the vision of what it would look like for uh, the Tampa St. Pete region. So here uh, in the middle, you see the red circle. Um, that's what you'd be able to reach uh, within an hour via car. And the white circle is what you'd be able to reach within an hour um, with a Lilium jet. So, one important note here is that you really see this is not just an urban air mobility solution uh, where you can go from Tampa airports to Tampa downtown or to St. Pete. This is really much more than this. It's, it's regional air mobility, which is actually arguably even more impactful because this is where you can achieve uh, the most time saving actually. And ultimately this expanded radius uh, of life for people means that people are able to do more and, and see more. Um, so there's no more reason to miss a, a dinner with your family who lives in Gainesville uh, because you can actually be there in 40 minutes now. And while this is really fantastic from a convenience perspective, it's also an incredible enabler for economic growth as the region gets increasingly connected. So with this service, for example, commuting between Tampa and Orlando will become much more comfortable and convenient um, and much more economic and business exchange can be done between the two cities. Next slide, please. One of the most important things and most incredible things, I think, is, is, is the infrastructure perspective. When you look at infrastructure traditionally, um, it's only been serving big communities, um, for example, with a road or a railroad. And not only is this extremely costly, but it takes years to build and can be a source of a lot of controversy. Um, as we've seen, for example, with uh, the California High Speed Rail project. On top of this, this kind of infrastructure is extremely polluting, um, has a large footprint, um, and just a really negative impact on biodiversity when you're cutting through a forest. 
So in this sense, eVTOL is really the infrastructure of the 21st century. There's essentially zero infrastructure except at the departure and at the arrival. And this comes at a minimal, put, minimal footprint in terms of CO2, uh, but also in terms of space. Um, and typically the investment will be only 1% of the capex compared to other modes of transport um, and will take just a few months to build. And while this type, with this type of mobility, you won't just be able to connect um, big hubs such as cities, but also underserved communities, um, which for now it didn't make sense to connect them via a high speed rail, for example, because it just was too expensive. In terms of the throughput, um, very important to note here, the landing pad that um, you're, you're about to see, uh, maybe we can move to the next slide actually. The landing pad that you see here um, is able to throughput um, hundreds of passengers per hour. So it becomes a really valid mobility option on such a small footprint. And the beauty behind the service is that if you have an aircraft which is able to take off and land vertically, has such a high safety level and low noise, you're able to operate within urban areas, not just from airports. So all you need is a landing pad, which could be, for example, um, on the top of a building or on top of um, a parking garage. And as the previous presentation with Christina highlighted, airports are an interesting location for landing pads, not because of the airport facilities, but rather because there's a constant throughput but at the same time, placing a landing pad on top of a parking garage in the middle of the city would be extremely cost efficient um, and can deliver a very impactful mobility solution. So the idea would be to place landing pads in a way which would be integrated into the existing public transit network um, so that you, know, you stop, you stop uh, working, you hop on a bus, and then you hop on your Lilium jet to go back in uh, the rural area where you could be living. And these pads can be bigger, they can be smaller, they're highly adaptable to, to the land that's been identified. Um, and of course, uh, the size will depend on, on the throughput as well that, um, that you would want to, to deliver with these landing pads. So maybe to conclude, eVTOL has really an incredible potential for every region around the world, um, including the Tampa Bay area. But it's, it's much more than that. You, you, you have a 360 degree connectivity, high speed connectivity, which will connect all of your region. And this comes really at a fraction of the cost of any other mobility option that you could be considering and can still deliver an extremely high throughput. So with this, um, thank you for listening and Tesla and I are open to questions. Thank you so much guys for that presentation. Uh, very, very impressive and and speaking for the region, I think there's widespread acceptance and support for your project in Tampa Bay, especially because we can leverage the water infrastructure and not have to build, you know, very costly concrete bridges across that, you know, and defer some of that because of air, air connectivity. Uh, one question I had um, from the public's acceptance of this, how soon do you think uh, it will take before you could ship to fully automated uh, uh, aircraft without a pilot? By 2025, we want this to be established as a means of transportation in selected geographies. Um, however, it will be a, you know, a transition phase of a few years, and it will not be zero one, but come in stages, basically, right? So really fully autonomous is um, a long way down the road. In the meantime, and after that could be a few years after entry into service, uh, it could be operated um, by a pilot who's on the ground. Then this pilot could maybe become a supervisor of several systems that are flying semi-autonomously um, um, also from the ground. And then when it transitions into, um, into auto full autonomy, then we would definitely be in the 2030s. Um, to give you a more tangible time frame in Europe, actually, EASA, which is the kind of FAA counterpart agency for aviation safety, has put out as a target number that by 24, 25, remotely piloted systems with passengers on board should be operating. There may be some delay uh, with rulemaking. 
there may be, again, a few years that we would like to collect experience and data um, in the meantime, but it will definitely um, uh, kick in in the second half of, of the 2020s in terms of remotely piloted. It is my understanding, too, that the platforms, uh, after a certain period of time, will be available to multiple vendors, such as airports are now, and it won't be ex exclusive to your company, is the way I understand that. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it, it would not make sense, right, to build such uh, landing pads like right. every other block, only because they are proprietary to individual um, operators. Obviously, you know, efficiency goes up if there is not 20 different operators who compete for eight parking positions, as we saw in the, in the rendering of the, of the landing site just a minute ago. Um, but actually also the, the world is big enough and there is not many projects who are so close actually to certification and therefore operations. So I think before we see actually conflicting interests here with respect to specific geographies, this will take quite some time. Uh, fantastic, and, and uh, we are very enthusiastic about that, uh, this project. Uh, we would like to, as Commissioner Long suggested before, enter into discussions about a potential P3 or partnership with you to facilitate the development and operation of your, your company throughout our region that we cover. Um, and we look forward to working and, and hopefully coming to some kind of understanding on the best way to do that and to the point of everyone's discussion earlier, you know, to cut through all the studies and a lot of the red tape and doing all this and, and really implement this incredible amenity for the, the people of Tampa Bay. Um, with that said, I'd like to open this up to other members' uh, questions and discussions about this. Um, uh, members? I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Kim. Thank you. Um, I was just reading about your company and I understand you had two test uh, planes and one of them on February 27th, one of the two crashed and was destroyed, burned up. Could you speak to how that will impact any development you're doing now? Yes, thanks a lot, Commissioner. And that is true and that related actually to the generation of demonstrators that we saw flying in the video. Uh, so we had uh, multiple of that generation. However, it is important to know two things. One, it was not a crash, but that happened actually during maintenance uh, when batteries were being exchanged. Um, so that is actually an event that obviously is unfortunate, um, but at the same time uh, is something that if you look at other electric vehicle manufacturers, happened in, let's say, Tesla's history also quite a few times actually before they went to market. And we are still a few years, quite a few years actually, before entry into commercial operations. That's one. The other is that it is thoroughly being investigated by the, by the relevant authorities uh, here in Germany and that there'll be a report to it. And third, it's very important to note that, again, this generation is a generation of prototypes, of demonstrators. Actually, FAA and the ASA, the European counterpart organization, just between last year and this year, actually, have published the certification basis and what they call the means of compliance. So basically the checklist against which you would be certifying such aircraft. And only on basis of that data, we can um, design and finalize design of the aircraft that then finally actually enter into market. It will be very, very similar to the generation we saw here. So you can expect a quite rapid process uh, in terms of certification of the aircraft because authorities know that aircraft as well. But we have to have, bear in mind that this aircraft was being designed prior to all these publications by the authorities on basis of a very small team um, by a factor of 10, not comparable actually in terms of size and in terms of depth of the experience to the team that we have currently on the ground and the thoroughness and, um, and strictness of processes that we have put in place in the meantime. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, other questions? Okay, well, thanks so much again for that presentation. We look forward to continuing a very uh, positive dialogue with you and your team as we move forward and, and start discussions about how we can actually enter into something to, to advance this forward in a very, very timely fashion. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. 
Yes, could I ask for um, a discussion about what is the next action item as it relates to this particular opportunity? Yes, I, I uh, David, I will defer to you because you uh, had some discussions with, uh, with their team, suggestions. I've actually not uh, had any conversations with their team. I spoke uh, with folks in terms of, you know, getting them lined up for the presentation today, but we've not discussed next steps at all yet. Okay, well, I would suggest that we do that sooner than later and, and enter into actual discussions on how a TBARDA can partner with you, can facilitate the development of your, uh, your op operations, and potentially as a pilot project for Tampa Bay, we do have an existence, an existing agreement, cooperation agreement with Tampa International Airport to investigate and implement possible uh, air taxi service in the area. So that's a, a framework that can be built upon to do that. I know you have been in contact with a variety of the counties in our area and cities for potential landing, um, landing facilities. So tell us how we can best help facilitate your your operation, and of course, we, we have to comply with all government procurement rules and standards, and our council will do that. But I, I think there's an incredible willingness on the part of this board uh, and the community to move forward with this project. And we would love to see Tampa Bay be the, the marquee project for demonstration in this state, certainly, and perhaps in the United States. So we Mr. Chair, the opportunity. As a, as a follow-up, may I ask for, um, if it would be okay if we ask David to come back to us by our board meeting next month with kind of a list of what is the criteria that Lilium or any company like them, I mean, we we're hearing from Lilium. And so I'm just curious what the next step might be to, um, to comply with getting in the pipeline if you will, for Tampa Bay to be selected. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would entertain a motion for a, a resolution to, uh, to move forward with, with concrete discussions with Lilium to, to, to implement um, uh, their project here in the area, how we can cooperate, uh, of course, in Hold total. On compliance with with government procurement standards and, and these type relationships so um, i'll move that forward okay. oh i see commissioner seal has all right is it do we have a second are there questions mr chair uh, commissioner seal would all like recognition oh yes commissioner seal thank you um i tried to raise my hand then i raised it virtually um Jim, you mentioned TIA, which probably would be, in my opinion, the best way to proceed. I'm thinking back to the old days, and I remember this as a child, when fran cable franchises came into the Tampa Bay area, and each of the local governments were competing to select who their franchise operator was. And then you watch that whole industry you know, age and then competition. And it, it was an, it's been an interesting journey. And I kind of think this could have the same um, trajectory. So, but thinking that TIA with their expertise and because they could help to cover the region might be able to put out like a request for negotiation and have that criteria so that, um, you know, we could have competition as to who would be interested in landing in the Tampa Bay area. Right. Uh, the other major question I guess I had is what kind of government monetary support are they looking for? And also um, given that we, I, I understand their model, but I guess I'm worried about the air traffic that comes in with commercial airplanes as to how this would all interact. So yeah, please answer. Please, if you can respond to those questions, uh, that might be helpful for Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Especially yes, if I may, in terms of traffic. yeah, in terms, would it be helpful if I elaborate on air traffic control for a yes, second? Yes, I think that's the main question. The other is uh, 
is a more procurement legal question. And I concur with the commissioner that perhaps building on our existing agreement with TIA that they could do the appropriate solicitation uh, to do that. And as the, the folks had indicated, this eventually will be um, like an airport open to all vendors. So I think it's important that we take the first step to do that since this will be a, essentially a, ultimately a non-proprietary endeavor. But yeah, please, please address the issue of, uh, of the air traffic in the area. I believe uh, my understanding is you already have the FAA approval under a certain uh, height limitation. Exactly. So air traffic control is a bit less complex, actually, with respect to eVTOL than it may look like uh, in terms of our aircraft being very flexible, right? We can um, obviously fly low altitudes, but we can also fly up to 10,000 feet. So that gives us a lot of flexibility for the longer haul flights by our standards. Uh, so that's the uh, Tampa or to the uh, Orlando or to the East Coast flight. Um, we would climb up and this would be mostly actually in so-called uncontrolled airspace. And that's a very empty airspace. Uh, where you have um, a lot of availability. When it comes to approaches into more busy airspace, like around airports or within airport um, facilities, actually, um, it would follow a so-called designed approach procedure. So that is something that is FAA approved um, and actually guarantees and safeguards that um, it's separated and segregated from existing operations. Uh, Mr. Chair had asked about uh, the autonomous or semi-autonomous stage by that time, we uh, expect uh, a completely different, basically, regulatory framework for, for drones and unmanned um, eVTOLs, and then you can even operate more densely. Um, with respect to Tampa International Airport, uh, obviously there's the, the legal uh, dimension to it and, and very happy to comply with whatever the, the requirements are. We have had a good um, uh, engagement with um, Joe Lepano and his team already in the past, um, we will be happy to continue that, and we are doing the same as we are doing everywhere in the world. Uh, we actually, you know, hand in hand together with local partners, proceed where they haven't. We bring them up to speed with respect to EVTOL, um, are being open with them in terms of the requirements and in terms of all the intelligence that we have, you know, by now built internally in terms of what, a, what an infrastructure looks like, what FAA's perspective on it is from a headquarters perspective. Um, and, uh, and in the end contribute to a process that will lead to landing uh, sites that obviously will not only be open to us. Okay, good. Karen, does that address some of your, uh, your issue? And, and I, I think going forward, obviously, we want to closely confer with our general counsel on the best mechanism for doing this to comply with all, you know, all procurement standards, which was our intent. But I think we need to, to advance forward to the next step whatever that is. And that was kind of the spirit of the resolution I was seeking. Commissioner Long, is that your, your, your resolution is to advance the dialogue with Lilium uh, to talk about next steps? Yes, but I would also like to have a by um, time frame in there so that we know we're going to get a, a report next month and it's not going to be six or seven months from now before we hear about it again. That, that is a point well taken. So that said, would you like to renew your motion and then or, and see if we have a second? Yes, I would like to move the recommendation forward to have more dialogue with William to outline their needs to um, eventually choose Tampa Bay to bring their project forward as a pilot project. And I would like to have a report on that information at our next board meeting. That's my motion, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And is there a second for that motion? Any members? Well, yeah, uh, this, is this is Commissioner Starkey. I, I would second that. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about what other companies are out there as well. So uh, makes me just a little nervous to proceed with the first one. Uh, but I'll, I will second her motion and. I, I think we're talking about someone taking the initiative and, and the non-exclusivity provisions of this to, to me indicate that all are welcome, you know, to cooperate with. So I, I don't think we're entering into a 
agreement that precludes any other vendor from doing the same. We're just trying to advance this forward for the sake of, of, of Tampa Bay. But uh, and, most could, and could I be clear for the sake of Commissioner Starkey, I'm not asking us to proceed with a procurement solicitation. I'm asking for the information about what we would need to do to position Tampa Bay. So, I mean, without that information, I don't know how we go forward with anything. Just one. Yeah, and, and I think we, I, I would say that we don't want to take a long time with this. If we want to be one of the leaders and innovators in the country on this um, exciting uh, mode of transport, I, I do think we need to act quickly. So. Therefore, I, I did second. Okay, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion, members? Okay, Jennifer, can you call the roll? Yep, Jim Holton? Yes. Liz Manuel? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Mayor Castor? Mayor Priceman? Yes. Rich McLean? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? Commissioner Kemp? Commissioner Starkey? Yes. Commissioner Mitten? Yes. And Commissioner Seal? Yes. Okay, so we did get eight approvals, so this motion does pass. Thank you so much, and, and folks, again, thanks for your presentation, and we look forward to moving forward with you in a very timely and uh, an expeditious fashion. So thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot.